Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. In the past few videos, we've talked about the reaction orders of chemical reactions, and we saw that all chemical reactions with the same reaction order have some similar properties. For example, all first-order reactions have reactant concentrations that change according to this equation. Plus, the half-life of any first-order reaction can be determined using this equation. Today, I want to tell you about second-order reactions. As I mentioned in the last video, first- and second-order reactions are by far the most common, so once you know about those two, you'll have some powerful tools that you can use in your own research when you're making new discoveries. But before we get into that, I first want to tell you about a useful and practical tip that researchers use when they study brand new first-order reactions. As we discussed last time, you can learn a lot about the rate of a first-order reaction using these two equations, but sometimes we don't have all the data we need to use them. For example, what if we don't know k, the rate constant? Today, I want to tell you about another way that we can get information about first-order reactions. It's one of the most common ways real researchers use to find the rate constant when they're studying a brand new reaction. The trick is to look carefully at the format of this equation. You may never have seen an equation exactly like this before you took this course, especially not one with a logarithm in it, but the general format of it actually is something you've probably seen before. Back when you took algebra or geometry in high school, you probably talked about graphs of straight lines, and you found out that straight lines all have the same format, y equals mx plus b where m is the slope of the line, and b is the y-intercept. Now look again at the equation we have for first-order reactions. It may not be obvious at first, but this equation actually has the same format as the equation for a straight line. In instead of y, the left side of the equation has the logarithm of a0 over at. On the right side, we have k, which is a constant just like m. Finally, we have t instead of x. The reaction for a straight line also ends with b, and it looks like there's nothing like that in our first order reaction equation, but we can make our equation look more like the other one if we imagine there's a plus zero at the end. So, the first order equation really is similar to the equation for a straight line. That means that if we have data for a first order reaction, we should be able to make a graph of it with time on the x-axis and the logarithm term on the y-axis. That should give us a straight line with a slope equal to k, the rate law constant, and a y-intercept of 0. Let's try it. Suppose we perform a first-order reaction and measure the concentration of the reactant at different times as the reaction happens. Here's the data we get. Suppose we want to know the rate constant. How can we get it? We can do it by making a graph like the one we were just talking about. The slope of the line we get will be equal to the rate constant. To make the graph, we just need time for the x-axis, and we already have that information. We also need the logarithm of a0 over at for the y-axis. We don't have that yet, but we can calculate it. For each row, we'll calculate the logarithm of a0 over at using the concentration at time 0 for a0. That gives us this data. If you have a table like this and it has a lot of rows, you can save yourself some time by doing the calculations using a spreadsheet like Excel instead of doing it all on your calculator. Anyway, we now have all the data we need. We plot time on the x-axis and the logarithm on the y-axis. That gives us this graph. If you use Excel to make the graph, it can tell you what the equation of the line is. Here's that equation. You can see that it has the usual format of a straight line. Here's y, m, x, and b. So the slope is 0 0.0023. Since our times were all in seconds, that means the units for k are seconds to the minus 1. So now we know the rate constant. This is a very common way of figuring out the rate constant of a new reaction when we discover one during our research. So, now we've looked pretty thoroughly at our first-order reactions. Let's now move on to second-order reactions. 
As I mentioned earlier, these are very common in nature. Suppose we have this simple second-order reaction. Just as with our earlier example, we start with one reactant and we get one product as a result. What will be the rate law for this reaction? From our previous discussion, you know that the rate law will be rate equals k times the concentration of each reactant raised to an exponent. Since this reaction only has one reactant, that means A will be the only reactant in the rate law. Also, since we know this is a second order reaction, we know that the exponent is 2. Just as we did when we looked at first order reactions, we want to get an equation that connects the length of time the reaction's been going to the concentration of the reactant that still remains. To do that, we need to use a little calculus. However, just like last time, I know that many people taking general chem probably haven't had calculus yet, so I'll skip the math and just give you the result. You'll learn about the math behind it if you take a course in physical chemistry, which I hope you will do someday. Anyway, if we do the bit of calculus, we get this equation. This time, our equation doesn't have a logarithm in it, but all the other symbols still mean the same things. We've got the final and initial reactant concentrations, the rate constant, and the amount of time. Let's try using this to find the amount of time needed for a reaction. Suppose we have this second order reaction, which has a rate constant of 0.543 molars to the minus 1 times seconds to the minus 1. If the initial concentration of nitrogen dioxide is 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molar, how long will it take for the concentration to drop to 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2 molar? We'll use this equation to find the amount of time. We know the two concentrations and the rate constant, so we'll plug those into the equation. When we subtract the two fractions on the left, we get 39.39. .39. Next, we solve for t, and we get 72.55 seconds, so that's how long our reaction takes. Notice that k has units of molars to the minus 1 times seconds to the minus 1. That's different than the units we had for k in a first order reaction. As I mentioned before, the units of k are different for different reactions, so you want to be careful when you determine the units of k. Let's try another problem. Suppose we perform the same reaction, still starting with a concentration of 1.65 times 10 to the minus 2 molars. What will be the concentration after the reaction has been going for 1.5 minutes? We use the same equation as last time, but this time our unknown isn't T, it's the final concentration, AT. So, first we'll plug in all the other data. Don't forget that the rate constant has seconds in its unit, so we need to convert the time into seconds. We solve the right side of the equation, which gives us 48.87 molars to the minus 1. Next, we add this fraction to both sides, which gives us 109.5 molars to the minus 1 on the right side. When we solve for AT, we get 9.13 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, so that's our final concentration. Now, just as we did for first order reactions, we can calculate the half-life of second order reactions. We do that by remembering that at the half-life, half the reactants have been used up, so the concentration of reactants will be half the original concentration. We'll put that down here in the denominator of the first fraction. That gives us 2 over A0 for the first fraction, minus 1 over A0 for the second fraction. When we combine those, we get 1 over A0. So that's the equation for the half-life of a second-order reaction. Let's use it. What would be the half-life of the second-order reaction we had in the previous question? We know the rate constant and the initial concentration, so we'll plug those into our equation. When we do, we get 112 seconds. Now let's take a second and review what we know so far. We've looked at both first and second order reactions, and for each of them we got an equation that ties the reactant concentrations to the time of the reaction. 
We also got equations for the half-life of each type of reaction, which are these. We also found out that we could find the rate constant for a first-order reaction by drawing a graph. It turns out that we can also use a graph to find the rate constant of a second-order reaction. Here's how we do it. Remember, a straight line has to form y equals mx plus b. Here's the equation of a second-order reaction. If we move the second fraction to the right side of the equal sign, the resulting equation has the same form as the equation of a straight line. Instead of y, the left side of the equation has 1 over at. On the right side, we have k, which is a constant just like m. Next, we have t instead of x. And finally, we have 1 over a0 instead of b. So, this second order equation is similar in form to the equation for a straight line. That means, if we have data for a second order reaction, we should be able to make a graph out of it with time on the x-axis and 1 over at on the y-axis. That should give us a straight line with a slope equal to k, the rate law constant, and a y-intercept of 1 over a0. Let's try it. Suppose we perform a second order reaction and measure the concentration of the reactant at different times as the reaction occurs. Here's the data we get. Suppose we want to know the rate constant. How can we get it? We can do it by making a graph like the one we were just talking about. The slope of the line we get will be equal to the rate constant. To make the graph, we just need time for the x-axis, and we already have that information. And we also need 1 over at for the y-axis, which we can calculate easily. That gives us this data. So now we plot time on the x-axis and 1 over at on the y-axis, which gives us this graph. If you use Excel to make the graph, it can tell you the equation of the line. Here's that equation. You can see that it has the usual format for a straight line. Here's y, m, x, and b. So the slope is 0 0.0286. Since our times were all in seconds, that means the units for k are molars to the minus 1 times seconds to the minus 1. So, now we know the rate constant. Again, this is a very common way of figuring out the rate constant for a new reaction when we discover one in our research. We just saw that when we have data for the concentration of a reactant over time, we can make a graph out of it for both first order and second order reactions. That's actually an especially useful trick, and one of the great things we can do with graphs like this is figure out what the reaction order is for a new reaction. For example, suppose we've just discovered this new reaction in which the reactant, butadiene, slowly forms products. One of the first things we might want to know is, what's the reaction order? We can find out by making the kinds of graphs we've been talking about today. As you might remember, for a first-order reaction, we have time on the x-axis and the logarithm of a0 over at on the y-axis. And for a second-order reaction, it's time on the x-axis again, and 1 over at on the y-axis. Let's make a plot of both of these for our reaction. In order to do that, we need data. We have the time and the concentrations. For the first order graph, we need to calculate the logarithm of a0 over at, which gives us this column. And for the second order graph, we need to calculate 1 over at, which is this column. Now we can draw both graphs. I'll plot these two columns to get the first order graph, which gives us this plot. Next, I'll plot these two columns to get the second order graph, which gives us this. Notice that there's a big difference between these two plots. We get a straight line for the second order plot, but we get a curve for the first order plot. That tells us that the reaction must be second order. 
This is a really useful trick to know about. Whenever researchers encounter a new reaction for the first time, this is a really common way of finding out the reaction order. We make plots using both first and second order equations, and whichever one gives us a straight line, that's the correct reaction order. Well, that's enough new material for now. You've learned quite a lot today. We've taken a good look at both first and second order reactions now, and that covers all the most common types of chemical reaction that you're going to encounter as an undergraduate. We'll get plenty of practice using all the concepts you just saw in class and on the homework, so you'll be in good shape when it's time for the next test. In the next video, we'll start to look at what exactly makes any of these reactions possible in the first place. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week!